This is a question which asks to compare the relative importance of committees in Congress with those of Parliament. In the past, our TV screens would have been regularly filled with the pictures of the late Dr. David Kelly, giving evidence to the Foreign Affairs Select Committee uh, about the factors that influenced the Ministry of Defence and its thinking on weapons of mass destruction. The impression of a gruelling interrogation may be accurate, but as, for instance, the recent um, investigation by the Home Affairs Committee into the London riots in which the Minister Theresa May was also in front of a select committee may not be an entirely a true reflection of how effective, particularly UK select committees are compared to their powerful US counterparts. For instance, at the moment, the Attorney General Eric Holder is facing, as it says, a grilling on the Fast and Furious program and its disastrous outcome in the United States, which saw, for instance, the attempted sting operation of sending weapons uh, to Mexican drug cartels, and uh, but on failure to recover these led to the death of Border Patrol agent Brian Terry. And there are serious calls now for Holder to resign. Parliamentary watchdogs are probably not as powerful as their US counterparts and are usually dismissed by most commentators. Even George Galloway's appearance before a congressional subcommittee to answer charges of aiding and abetting the Iraqi regime was much more significant than anything that happened to him and criticisms made of him in Britain. Professor Robert Singh from Birkbeck College London comments that unlike government dominated committees at Westminster, the influence of congressional committees is substantial. Singh's checklist for committees in Congress provides a clear platform for comparing it with Parliament. They can, according to Singh, identify and research public problems. Thus, the congressional investigations into Watergate and around Contra and into the Hurricane Katrina are often held up as powerful mechanisms of holding the executive to account. One leading, obviously, to the removal of a president from office and the other to the head of FEMA, Michael Brown. Critics of the British system note that committees like that which examined the fate of the Millennium Dome are so afraid of criticising their political masters, the government, that their reports are often anodyne and bland. Some recent examples of the Foreign Affairs Select Committee which investigated British involvement in Sierra Leone. A Labour-led uh, departmental select committee was unwilling to make obvious criticisms of the entanglement of the Foreign Office with mercenary fighters. It is often the courts or a judicial inquiry like that of Hutton or one into the Molokantar helicopter disaster that puts the executive on the defensive. Likewise, proposed, the proposed redeployment of British troops in recent years from Bajor to Baghdad under US command met with little criticism from the Defence Select Committee uh, under its chair, Bruce George. In the United States, however, committees can examine proposals put forward by individual lawmakers, party leaders and the president. Thus, the McCain and Feingold campaign finance reforms, which dominated both the House and the Senate in recent years. Equally, a number of committees have shaped the final version of the Department of Homeland Security, which was proposed by the Bush administration in the post-9-11 period. When Newt Gingrich, the Speaker of the House, his contract with America uh, was poured over by committees. In the United Kingdom, in contrast, standing committees, always with government majorities in both Commons and Lords, Consider legislation, but this is almost exclusively that of the executives. The main criticism is that via the use of guillotines and timetabling, these committees often leave unchecked large chunks of legislation. In the last Parliament, Anne Whittacombe and Conservative colleagues conducted a sit-in at a standing committee, dealing with new powers which were proposed to be given to the police to DNA test suspects. One further important contrast is that while congressional standing committees are permanent and selected by the votes of representatives, standing committees in Parliament are largely selected by the party leaderships and will only serve for the duration of the legislation. In the US, the main criticism is that these committees are beholden to political action committees and lobbyists who expect legislative gains for their clients who help fund the congressman's or senator's re-election. In the UK, criticism of this type is rare Although the passage of the relaxation of the gambling laws did see allegations that two of 16 on the committee 
were in receipt of backing from casino groups. Both US and select, uh, standing and select committees and parliamentary DSEs do convene the hearings and take testimony. Thus, when Henry Hyde's House International Relations Committee investigate links between the IRA and the Colombian terrorist group FARC, Hyde's committee had complete independence to call upon who it liked. However, congressional committees have much larger staffs. And uh, therefore can research issues at greater length than their UK counterparts, who are severely understaffed. Congressional committees also have the power of subpoena, which requires all witnesses to testify when the UK this power does not yet exist. That said, the use of the Fifth Amendment protects witnesses from self-incrimination and undermines US committees' effectiveness. In Britain, many witnesses um, have not answered questions, as Edwina Curry did over the Salmonella crisis. While DSEs in Parliament have been praised for stinging reports of, say, the Wembley Stadium fiasco, and the way they stood up for Dunwoody and Anderson following the attempts by the government to terminate their chairing of committees. Dunwoody's committee had been particularly critical of government transport policy, but it's hard to conceive of such interference in the composition of congressional committees. Members of Congress tend to pick their committees based upon interests. Farming state senators and House members will be drawn to agricultural committees. As Cheryl points out, military committees are loaded with hawks. Farm committees are crowded with neo-farmers. Meanwhile, the Winterton and Abbott case in recent years, where there were both their attempts to remove them from the committees of their choice, show how the executive in the UK effectively picks who sits on backbench select committees. Committees of both Congress and Parliament produce reports. The difference here is that while parliamentary reports carry no requirement upon government to act, those of Congress genuinely make its own laws. Attempts, for instance, to balance the budget in the 1980s and 90s in the US may have been supported by Reagan and to a certain extent Clinton, but the legislation bore the names of Graham and Rudman, both members of Congress. The Campaign Finance Reform Act of recent years may have been signed by Bush, but it carries the names of Feingold, Feingold, Feingold and McCain. Uh, when did you ever hear of a piece of legislation named after a backbench MP, with the exception of non-controversial private members bills? However, one contrast which makes parliamentary committees look good Peter Hennessy comments that while with all their faults, parliamentary committees of all types are not susceptible to pressure group lobbying, as they are essentially creatures of party. In contrast, their US counterparts are often in hock hack to hock to lobbyists who have paid via political action committees for their election campaigns. In 1998, the Senate Commerce Committee voted 19 to 1 to approve tough new tobacco legislation. However, the tobacco industry then ran a $40 million TV ad and the Senate refused uh, to follow the lead of the committee. The smell of corruption in Congress is said to be endemic. Hardly a vote is passed or motion tabled without some special interest being paid off. For instance, Senator Conrad Burns was able to gain a $3 million appropriations for an Indian tribe in Michigan on behalf of their lobbyists, um, led by Jack Abramoff. While, as earlier stated, allegations were made that the two Labour MPs on the Standing Committee uh, looking at the proposed setting up of Las Vegas-style casinos in the UK were paid clients of an American casino company, there has been little serious evidence that MPs are in hock to special interests in the way that the US counterparts, counterparts patently are. Another contrast is that while in Britain the committee stage of legislation is only one part of a process leading to the passage of a bill, in the US, the committee chairs often have the power, and even many subcommittees have the power, to strangle legislation. Some 8,500 potential laws are introduced into Congress each year, while Parliament considers only perhaps 25 bills at most. While nearly all of those 25 laws will pass with few amendments made in committee, and where they are, often are in the Lords, only to be reversed, the laws which Congress eventually do pass are often via a conference committee involving both accommodation between the Senate and the House and then only subject to the use or non-use of the veto by the President. While the Commons and Lords do attempt to find uh, accommodation over legislation, there is no formal mechanism to achieve this. A 
final area to consider is the contrasting power of Congress and Parliament with regard to recommending or rejecting nominees for office. Simply put, Parliament has no say over PM appointments. Thus, in the last government, Baroness Amos was made Leader of the Lords and Hilary Benn made International Development Minister and Peter Hayne was sent to Northern Ireland. However, the Senate Judiciary Committee refused to recommend Charles Pickering as a federal judge and George Bush lost him. Senate committees did not did approve John Bolton to the UN and John Roberts as Chief Justice of the Supreme Court. The conclusion must be that congressional committees are potentially more influential than their UK counterparts. This was the design of the Constitution and is part of the separation of powers doctrine. However, the political reality of committees in Congress is that those is that they often find it hard to provide leadership and can appear as weak as those of the Commons and even Lords. The fact that Congressional Committees sprawled to number over 200 only means that a Senator will find himself up, on up to 10 committees, making it impossible to do his work effectively. On the plus side, the DSCs at least give backbench MPs an opportunity to become informed critics of government policy.